Coming up on Need to Know, there's a question that has plagued our community for decades. What will it take to improve educational outcomes for city school students? We'll learn how one thing, equity, could change everything. Also on the show, they've escaped war, violence, persecution, and natural disasters. And some who now call Rochester home are still living with uncertainty. A new meaning for World Refugee Day just ahead. And meet a local valedictorian with a heart for others and a mean forehand. Our Top of the Class series continues right here on Need to Know. Stay with us. There's an opportunity gap that exists in urban education. And for those watching the program right now who live in Monroe County but outside the city of Rochester, this gap matters to you too. How? The fate of our suburbs is deeply connected to the livelihood of our cities, including our public schools. But closing that opportunity gap can happen. And according to my guest today, it can happen through equity. Here to explain how is a familiar face. Sean Nelms, an associate professor at the University of Rochester and superintendent of East High School, and a special guest invited to Rochester by the U of R, Pedro Nogueira. Pedro is a renowned expert on public education in America, a sociologist, and a distinguished professor of education at UCLA. Welcome, it is great to have you here. Thank great you. Great to be here, Helene. So to begin, Pedro, Briefly explain this opportunity gap in education and how it relates to equity. Sure. Uh, so, we, as many people know, we've been focused as a nation on the achievement gap yeah. for many years now. Um, and those are the very pronounced and predictable disparities in achievement that tend to correspond to race and, and class. What we haven't focused on are the opportunity gaps that also correspond to the achievement gaps. Um, and when you think about it, it's almost obvious. That is that the same kids that are underperforming academically yeah. have basic needs that aren't being met. They are, um, don't have adequate health care, they don't have adequate nutrition, but on top of that, they often go to schools that are under-resourced. They don't have access to lab equipment, they don't have access to the courses they need, or in some cases, even teachers who are qualified to teach those courses. If you don't close those opportunity gaps, there's no way you're gonna see a reduction in the disparities in outcomes. And so what we've been trying to draw attention to is that doing more work on the opportunity disparities will help us in the long run to create schools that are more equitable and that produce better outcomes for all kinds of kids. So when we talk about equity, Sean, what does that mean exactly for people unfamiliar with that term in relation to education? What does it mean? Absolutely. I think it's about creating an opportunity for all students have access um, to different resources in the community, if it's resources that are through teaching actual people, human resources, or, or material goods. I'll give an example. My first uh, year at East, I met with all of our teachers and to to understand what their true needs were for curriculum and instruction and opportunities. And I was speaking to our digital photography teacher who said, uh, I have a request. And I said, uh, what, would you, what do you need to make this class a success? We need cameras. And so there's a great divide when you have courses in schools that have uh, required uh, materials and resources like a camera and digital photography and they're not available. When I worked in two suburban schools, digital photography class not only had cameras, they had a green screen, they had digital labs, um, and so they took Photography not as a, 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 the physical point of taking pictures, but how do you use that to become a graphic designer and an artist and a food magazine critic? And so our opportunities um, in the city schools often lack because we don't make those opportunities uh, a priority. So equity is about using school resources to create a, a, a playing field that allows our students to compete uh, nationally and globally. Well, Pedro, you are the keynote speaker for an event hosted by the Center for Urban Education at the University of Rochester's Warner School. Rochester is a not new territory for you. You are very well aware of the challenges that exist within our city schools. That being said, when you look at Rochester, what do you see when it comes to our educational landscape? So Rochester is also typical of many cities, large and small, across America, because the problems are very common. Uh, and they're related to 
uh, concentrated poverty and, and the fact that across America we've isolated the poor and we have expected schools to solve problems that are not simply educational. Right? Kids who don't, are hungry don't do as well as kids who are full. Right? Um, and we ignore the fact that we have basic needs in children that haven't been addressed. So part of this equity agenda that, that Sean's spoken to is about taking a more integrated and a more holistic view of our schools and of our kids and what they need to be successful. Equity always has to be focused on outcomes. We can never take the position that because kids are poor, they can't learn, they can't achieve. That's, that, that to me would be going in the, op the wrong direction. But we must ask the question, how do we compensate for the effects of poverty? How do we create schools that can serve as a means to break the cycle of poverty? That's the question we haven't answered, asked, much less answered. And I think once you start to really think about it, you recognize that poverty is not simply an economic condition, mm -hmm. it's a cultural condition, it's a psychological condition. Part of what we have to change is the mindset in kids, to get them to believe and to see that something different is possible for them. But that can't just be reduced to a slogan, it has to also come with a plan for how do I get from where I am to where I want to be. If we want kids to go to college, then we have to make college accessible, and we have to start thinking about college not in 12th grade but way back in elementary school which is what middle class families do for their kids. And it's what's happening with this partnership between East High and the University of Rochester for one. So we'll talk about that plan though, right? So like, let's answer that. What types of things need then to be implemented so that those those resources are capitalized on and we are looking at outcomes? Yeah, so I, I think there are many different levels, layers and levels to this. I think there is a curricular and instructional lens, uh, as I gave an example, in terms of making sure that our priorities are supported by the curriculum that students um, are exposed to. But there's also um, other uh, factors, and there's a lot of work around trauma-informed care. So uh, how do we organize our schools in ways that mitigate some of those unhealthy conditions that kids come to school with by having school-based health clinics and having uh, uh, dental and, and vision care support at the school level? That's an opportunity to create equity um, and access. I think equity and access is, 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 is also important. How do we then structure our day that, uh, in ways that allow teachers and students to actually integrate on a personal level, not just a professional level, so that kids understand how to appropriately interact with adults outside of school. So there are many different levels um, and examples of how you address equity, and schools play a key role to that, but they must identify what those issues are and then make them a priority in their, um, their planning. It has to be structural, it has to be systemic, it can't be something that's done by, um, by the seat of our pants. Well, Pedro, you have said that federal education policies, such as No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top, in addition to the education reform movement, have all failed, and that they are not producing the improvement public schools promised. And you've said that has also contributed to the educational crisis facing black male students in particular. So when we hear about creating this equity, and it sounds right, and, and, and I, I understand where you're coming mm -hmm. from, how does that work, though, and how do we get buy-in from a district like Rochester, which has seen leadership and has also seen reform efforts come and go? Yeah. So it's, it's really got to be a whole shift in the way we think about the work. Um, so I want to really commend the University of Rochester, world-class university, for stepping up and risking its own reputation and committing to this um, this high school and hopefully setting an example not just for Rochester but for the country because uh, how is it possible that we have excellent institutions of higher education mm -hmm. across America and so many mediocre and poor schools yeah. there's something wrong with this whole picture in education in America today and it's because the, the, the connections between higher ed and our K-12 system are so weak so I think part of what we have to shift is move away from this kind of top-down accountability which we've embraced through No Child Behind and Race for the Top where we um, dictate to schools what you must do but don't provide the support and don't build the capacity to get the work done. If Rochester and the university can demonstrate through a capacity building approach that it's possible to shift outcomes and sustain those that will be truly a breakthrough that could not only influence the way we approach education reform elsewhere, but also hopefully at some point change the way we've approached policy at the state and the federal level. 
So when you mentioned the example of the University of Rochester, mm -hmm. are there any other examples of cities, right, around the country? And I know you mentioned that there are comparable cities to Rochester all over, but that they have done this. So we, we've seen changes within the city, whether it's uh, with, with crime rates and poverty levels, but also we've seen changes within the education system. Uh, again, I'm talking about cities mm -hmm. kind of same scale as Rochester, and these things are working that we can learn from. We've mm -hmm. got this great example with U of R and East. Are there others that we can look to? Well, I'll tell you that this, this is uh, one of the reasons that Pedro is here is he's, he was brought here by the Center for Urban Education Success, or CUES. It is a new um, branch of the Warner School of Education, and their mm -hmm. sole purpose is actually to do just that, is to study um, the issues that impede success in urban schools, to create consortiums with other universities and partners throughout the nation so we can learn from them, they can learn from us. And so this is um, the beginning part of that. And so the Center for Urban Education Success is, is, is we're looking for the best and brightest to come in and educate us as a university, but also to educate our community. You ask the question, where do you begin? And how do you avoid um, uh, issues as, as because of the constant turnover in the city or turn turnover in superintendents? It has to start by identifying the root causes and the issues that this, that this community demands. Our community has clearly articulated what they want from our school system. They want to have safe environments. They want to have curriculum that prepares our, our, our students for um, college and career. They want to have administration that is re responsive. And we also want to have a community-wide approach to this problem. If they've identified that over the last 20 or 30 years, this is what Rochester wants, then our policies and our practices and our beliefs must be aligned to that. And so our responsibility as educators is not to come in and create new agendas for the community. I think the, the shift is how do we respond to what the community has been begging for for so many years. And the EPO plan was created based on the feedback from our students, our teachers, and our community and as they identify the critical needs at East. And I think that's why we've seen such progress so far is because we're being responsive. We're not dictating what should happen. We are creating a, a plan of attack based on those identified needs that had a strong voice and strong input from the community. Well, unfortunately, our viewers will, will see this tonight uh, at 8 o'clock, and this will be after uh, your presentation today uh, you know, at, at East High School with the University of Rochester. But, Pedro, what is part of that message that you think is important to drive home to viewers that you'll share tonight, you'll, you'll share while you're here in Rochester, uh, to, to further make this point about what this means to create excellent schools through equity? So part of what I want to do is share good news, and that is that it's being done. There are places where it's happening. You can go to Worcester, Massachusetts and find Worcester Tech, which serves inner city kids, and it's, it's one of the best high schools in the state. Or go to Brockton High School, the largest high school in the state, that is a, also a level one school, despite the fact that Brockton is still a poor community. So there are examples like that throughout the country that we need to learn from, and that I think could serve as a model for Rochester as well. Very good. Well, Pedro Nogueira and Sean Nelms, I appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you for joining me. To hear more, be sure to turn in, tune in to the podcast from today's live broadcast of Connections with Evan Dawson. You can check out the hour-long interview with Pedro Nogueira and Sean Nelms. That's at WXXINews.org. Just click on the Connections link. Somalia, Bhutan, Nepal, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burma. These are a handful of the many nations represented among Rochester's refugee population. While their ethnic and cultural backgrounds are quite different, their stories of survival and their paths to Rochester have similar themes. And on World Refugee Day, those stories will come together in an effort to advocate for refugee rights and build bridges when there may be misunderstanding. Joining me in the studio to talk about the purpose and plan Plans of World Refugee Day here in Rochester is Fazir and the Hero, the founder and president of Rochester Global Refugee Services, and Geta Chow Bashir, Refugee Resettlement Program Manager for Catholic Family Center. Welcome to both of you. Welcome back, Fazir. It's good Thank to see you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. So just to begin, Fazir, explain the purpose of World Refugee Day in Rochester. What is this intended to do? Uh, mainly, uh, Refugee Day is not uh, actually funded by Rochester Global Refugee Services. It's a UN event, so it's, it happens all around the world, and it doesn't matter what country. But uh, in Monroe County, this is our, actually our third year actually hosting it. So as a general, that brings all uh, organizations together, the communities and stuff like that. But mostly the purpose of it is really bringing awareness of refugees in a community. Because we, we live with refugees, we, but we don't really know who who are they, where they're coming from, and why they come here. So we want really to bring awareness of why refugees come here and why we really want to help them get included in the community and be able to be part of the community. 
I know there are, there are some of the everyday struggles that people may not understand when it comes to uh, our refugee population. Uh, what are some of those everyday struggles? And I'll give this to you, Get a Child, mm -hmm. that, you, that you too hope to bring and the, in the representative organizations that you represent that you hope to bring to this day in particular? Uh, uh, refugees are struggling uh, so many ways. And the first one is being in a place uh, that they do not know. They do not know the city, the neighborhood. They do not know the language. They do not know how to get around. And most of them, they don't have uh, family members here. So they feel lonely too. So uh, they have so many struggles in this area. They uh, come, some of them, with uh, children, getting those children into school, and for uh, themselves getting uh, the language skills and uh, uh, skills to enable them work and become self-sustained. So there are so many challenges that they face in, an, in their new place. And Vizier, we've talked about kind of the, the, the president's proposed changes to immigration policy and his travel ban have added to, to some of the pressure uh, and some of this uncertainty uh, that, that some of our, the members of our refugee population are feeling right now. Actually, uh, when you look at it, it was, it, it's really scary in a way, uh, not only for refugees who are really being allowed to come to Rochester or any other state, but also refugees who are in, in the country, because it, it's, it's a fear of people that we're living together in a neighborhood, how they are reacting to what is going on. So we are really trying to really feel, I can't say that most of the people are really feeling fear, that kind of way of saying what will happen. Are, they, are we really going back? Are we really getting chances to really do what we are supposed to be doing and be part of the community? Because they want to be part of the community. They want to be part of this country. But if people are not welcoming them and they're really discriminating them in a way, I can't blame them, but I, I can blame someone for not knowing, but I can't blame someone for not knowing. So we want really to help people understand and know what is the refugee, so they can be able to understand how they can live and help refugees to be included in the community. And, and being included in the community also means on this day uh, that this is for everybody. This is this event is not just for our refugee population, yeah, mm -hmm. but also non-refugees born and raised in Rochester. Uh, get a child. How do you want people uh, in the community to? I guess those watching, they would say, "Why should I come? Why should I be a part of this?" What would you say to them? Well, uh, in the first place, we have to understand why these people come to uh, Rochester or other places for uh, need of safety. Uh, we share that. We human beings want to live in a safe place. But unfortunately, there are lots of people who cannot stay safe in their home. Once they leave their home, they, the first choice uh, they make usually is to go back to their homes. They come here as a last resort. So once they come to safety, they want to be self-sufficient and live a productive life. So it is good for others to understand why these people come and to help them achieve their goals, uh, just to like what we like for ourselves, to like it for others. So to understand uh, refugees more, uh, to, uh, to talk to them, and to show them support, moral support, if possible, material support. So you're saying there are benefits to this intercultural dialogue. Yeah. I, in, in addition to that, when, I, when, I, when we're talking about this issue is, because I've had a lot of uh, really feedback from people that, I, uh, that I'm meeting with or talking to or anywhere, actually saying, oh, you're a stranger, you should go back to your country, or this and this. I've got that. I've had that really personally as ex personal experience. So if I'm, I'm Experiencing this, when I think about it in a community or people who are around the country, what are really facing? So I would really encourage people to not only take what they hear on news, but reach out and really one-on-one -on -one refugees, so you can really better understand them. Because nobody, no one, ever want to be called a refugee. So in that case, nobody want to leave their country to be here. So if we are here, we are here just for survival. So we need to be able to be included in the community and be able to be welcomed. So you can't really know, understand it if you can't be part of it. So we, we are actually in, encouraging people to come on Refugee Day, get that experience, really understand the stories. So this is, beyond this day, there are opportunities to 
partner and volunteer with both of your organizations yes. and others that exist in Rochester yes. to expand upon this work. We've got less than 30 seconds. I'm so sorry for Zir. Just quickly tell us what will take place on World Refugee Day. So there is uh, there is two sessions. I can say two, two ways. Uh, there is a parade that we have actually from uh, Washington Park to City Hall starting from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, we are actually expecting male everyone to join us on uh, uh, um, Washington Park by any chance so but after that we are actually meeting at the Jones Square Park where we, everybody is going to be there we have our organization fair there giving information tabling and also speakers which actually we have some candidates of who are running for the mayor office and the other uh, officials around the world, uh, around the Rochester. Very good. Well, yeah. a special thank you to my guests for joining me today. Get a child Bashir and Fazir and a hero. Please mark your calendars. World Refugee Day is scheduled for Saturday, June 17th in Rochester. The events of the day, as you heard from Fazir, start at 2 p.m. with a parade. And for more details, go to facebook.com slash Rochester World Refugee Day. And now it's time for Top of the Class. News coverage, including the youth voice, gauging the youth perspective, and digging into issues affecting our youth are of importance to WXXI. And part of that coverage includes identifying and connecting with young people, in this case, high school students, who are not only working hard in the classroom, but also want to make our community and our world a better place. Need to Know's Top of the Class series introduces you to these amazing young people. Tonight, meet Tori Hafen, valedictorian at East Rochester Junior senior high school. <laughs> Tori's really easygoing. She's fun loving, but she also keeps a really good balancing act with her, you know, charity work and with school. So she's kind of like an all-around kind of person. Hi Adriana. Hi Hannah. Hi. Sometimes I think she's gonna take over the world. Some because to her determination is like second to none. She's done this since she was in my uh, elementary art class when she was a first grader. She just strives to do her best at anything she does. And, and it's not really an extrinsic uh, motivator. I think it's more intrinsic. She just does it because that's who she is. Sadie, I missed this. We played tennis together for three years and she's always like one of the most positive people on the team. I was a partner and if I made a mistake, she never made me feel bad. Tori always like boosts someone's mood and she's, she's always like willing to help you. She's always motivating me. She motivates me to, you know, get something done early. Like with assignments, I would say she helps me. Like, you know, she says, oh, we have to get this done and try and get it done, you know, not at the last minute. The volunteer, the, the leadership roles, the, you know, whatever it may be in athletics or in music or whatever it is, she has a positive influence out of no fault of her own, just because of being the person that she is. You know, kids look up to her and, and, and realize that she's just a, someone, someone to try to be like. East Rochester Junior Senior High School valedictorian Tori Hafen joins us now and welcome to the show. So it's important, and I've said this before uh, for this segment, for media outlets to make a concerted effort to get to know what matters most to our young people uh, in any given city, any community around the country. So that being said, there's a question I ask everybody that we recognize for this series, and that is what are some of the social issues uh, of most importance to you and why? I think one of the main ones would be just like animal rights and everything because I grew up with animals. I always had an animal in my house. Like my dogs are like my favorite things in the world and just knowing that they can't help themselves. Like they don't know what's happening to them and why this is happening and they can't say anything for themselves and then people are just abusing them and testing things on them. It just, it breaks my heart. And people should know you volunteer at Lollipop Farms. Yeah. Uh, so again, to, to show your <laughs> level of commitment to that, there was a great comment made by your vocal music teacher, John Polvino, when I interviewed him and he said, in addition to thinking that you may take over the world, uh, he said that you're the stellar role model for underclassmen and when they think about everything that you do in school and then they find out that you've balanced all of your activities with your schoolwork and your valid Victorian, they are amazed. So I asked them, what's your secret? What drives you? And they were kind of like, man, I mean, they gave me different ideas, but I'll ask you, what is it that drives you? I just, my family, they're always so supportive and my sister always did really well in everything she did. So it was like, oh, like I want to be just like her. And like, she's my role model. So definitely looking up to her drives me. 
Well, I'm going to quickly run through some of your activities, and I am unintentionally leaving things out because I can't keep up. But you play the flute, you're on varsity tennis, you're National Honor Society, you're involved in student government, you're in choral music, you've been in a number of school musicals, and you do community service work such as Lollipop Farms and also Sing Out, which raises funds for various charities. Another thing that you were involved in, the American Legion Empire Girls State Program. So you were one of two representatives from East Rochester to attend. What does the program involve and what did you learn? It's a lot about the state government and it like you totally get immersed and it's just an amazing experience. You just meet all these people from all across New York and yes, you learn about government, but you learn about all these different cultures and people and it's just an amazing experience. So based on that, are there any plans for a, a political career in your future? I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think it's really my type of thing. I, I'm going to go into nursing and hopefully help people that way. Your, your teacher said to me, and also your peers, uh, they said that you are the epitome of a leader, but also very empathetic. So, so two things important for the nursing field. What is it about the healthcare system and nursing in particular that, that draws you in? It's just the whole experience, like I love Grey's Anatomy and like all of these doctor shows and I was like, when I was thinking what I wanted to be and how I wanted to help people, like helping people was the main thing that I wanted to do. I was like, I could do this, like nursing and there's so many options and I'm just excited to see what I can do for people. And you're going to St. John Fisher College. What, in terms of nursing, what particular route do you want to go? I will hopefully become a nurse anesthetist in the future. And what does that person do? For those who don't know. They, <laughs> they kind of help the anesthesiologists. Like I have to go to more school to do it, but it's definitely gonna be worth it. Tori, for, for young people watching this program, what would you say to encourage them to make the most of, your, of their school journey? Because clearly it's not just about activities for you. Um, it, it's also about working hard, putting in long hours. But your friend said to me that you also don't take yourself too seriously. You, you enjoy life, so you could teach a lot of us you know, how to balance things out. But what, what, what advice would you give to young people? I would say don't stress. Life is supposed to be fun and school, and you just make the most of everything and create these memories that you're gonna have for the rest of your life. Great. Well, we are out of time, but a special thank you to my guest, Tori Hafen, uh, for Need to Know's Top of the Class Series. We thank you, Tori, for all that you do, uh, not only for your peers, but also for our community. And that wraps up another edition of Need to Know, Rochester's News Magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight. And a special thank you to those who tune in online at WXXINews.org. Have a great night.